Good morning, Walnut Village Church. I am coming to you actually from my living room because I thought since we're talking about Christmas stories for these next several weeks, having a Christmas tree might just help a little bit with uh, um, the background there. So will you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father and gracious God, thanks for your word, for the story and the truth and the beauty of your coming to our world to rescue us in the form of your son, Jesus Christ. Bless our study today and all that are hearing it. In your name, amen. So just as an introduction, today we're going to focus a little bit on um, Matthew's gospel. And we're looking at uh, the kingly line that comes through David. And we're talking about the theme and the name God with us, Emmanuel. Well, as a former tax collector, also called Levi, Matthew was qualified to write an account of Jesus' life and teaching. A tax collector of that day had to know Greek, be literate, well-organized, and some think that Matthew was actually the recorder among the disciples and took notes of Jesus' teaching. We might say that when Matthew followed Jesus, he left everything behind except his pen and paper. Matthew notably used his literary skills to become the first man ever to compile an account of the teaching of Jesus. No small task. Although we have some details that help fill out the story surrounding the birth of Jesus and offering support of Luke's record of events, Matthew actually tells us little about the birth of Jesus, just a few sentences. Luke, too, records those familiar details. What Matthew focuses on and tells us regards things that happened to Jesus after he was born in Bethlehem. You know, the stories of Herod, the wise men, the escape to Egypt, those stories that we don't see in Luke or in the Gospel of John. Now, Matthew begins his account of the life of Jesus Christ with the record of the royal and patriarchal lineage of Jesus, and it runs right through uh, to the king. King David of Israel as Israel's, and Israel's patriarch Abraham. So the Gospel of Matthew is deeply rooted in Judaism, and so that's why Matthew stresses this royal lineage. But at the same time, uh, he, he, is, he is able to look back, uh, and he is able to look forward and beyond. It, it, you, the Gospel of Matthew uh, sees itself as more than just a message for the Jewish people, but rather it is a message for the whole world. That's what's going on in, the, in our study today of Matthew. So today we read and focus Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through chapter 2, uh, 18. Let me read part of it for us. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. I'm going to just stop really quickly with that sentence. Matthew tells the story through the eyes of Joseph. That's the perspective for the book of Matthew. Okay, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. Being a righteous man, interesting description of Joseph. Joseph knew that if Mary had been unfaithful to him, it would be impossible to go through with the marriage. Yet his nature as this righteous man also did not want to take revenge, did not want to take an, uh, make an unnecessary hardship for Mary or create a stigma upon her. Joseph made the understandable decision to seek a quiet divorce. And when he did this, he was showing a great kindness. And there's an interesting observation that Spurgeon makes. He says this, when we have to do severe things, let us choose the tenderest manner. Maybe we shall not have to do it at all. And we know that's the story with Joseph. He was trying to do the right thing. He was being tender. He was being kind. He was thinking about Mary, not just himself. And then what happens? God, in a sense, for his plan, rescues Joseph, rewards Joseph for being a righteous man. And Joseph could 
go through with the marriage did not have to quietly divorce Mary. So as Spurgeon says, when we do have to do something severe, let's choose kindness, and maybe we won't have to do it at all. Okay, verse 20. As he considered this, Joseph again, an angel of the Lord to, appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her conceived by the, is conceived by the Holy Spirit. Well, what do you think Joseph thought when he heard that, when he dreamed that? I don't know what I would think. The dream came, though, while Joseph was considering what steps to take. So God gives this dream to Joseph at just the right time, just the right timing, where Joseph is ruminating, chewing, worrying, angsting, trying to figure out what does he do with this incredible situation. Joseph was understandably troubled by Mary's mysterious pregnancy. Her, he was also worried about her future and what he should do concerning her. Though he had not decided to put her away secretly, he was not comfortable with that decision. He, hadn't, he, he couldn't get his head around that decision just yet. But also think about this. It seems that from reading the story that Mary had not told Joseph that she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. This shouldn't come as any surprise to us, though. Think about it. How could anyone explain that? How could, if this were you, if you were Mary, how would you explain it to Joseph? So only something supernatural like God sending the angel uh, could really help Joseph understand it. Uh, the angelic word that uh, Joseph received obviously was persuasive, and Joseph was able to move forward then. Verse 21 and, and this is, the, again, the angel. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So as was later said by the apostle Peter, there is no other name under heaven by which men will be saved other than Jesus. Wonderfully, it says in, in this um, uh, direction from the angel, the description is, he will save his people. People. Now note, if it had said God's people, we might have thought it was reserved for the Jewish people alone. But it isn't just for the Jewish people. And it isn't being Jewish that brings salvation from sin. No, it is belonging to Jesus, being one of his people. That's why the term his people is so important. So here, Matthew gives us a description of the work of Jesus. He first says uh, that uh, he will save us from the penalty of sin. We've all missed the mark. We've all sinned, uh, and there is a penalty. Then Jesus will uh, save us from the power of sin. That is, he'll be active in our lives to help us uh, avoid uh, falling temptation to sin. And then finally, he will save us from the presence of sin. Uh, verse 22, all of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So that phrase, to fulfill, this is the first use of it, but it's an important phrase, which we'll see as we work our way through uh, the Gospel of Matthew. It will uh, come up and be a familiar theme several times after that. And then the other thing to notice here is the name, Emmanuel. This title of Jesus refers both to his deity, that is, God with us, here on earth, incarnate, human, with us, and his identification and nearness to man. Again, both meanings, God with us, his deity, and God with us, his nearness to man. And we don't want to lose sight among all the miracles here, one of the greatest is shown by how low God bent down to save humankind. I mean, think about it. He added the nature of one of his own creatures to his own divine nature, accepting the weaknesses, the frailties, and the dependency. I mean, baby Jesus couldn't diaper himself, couldn't feed himself, couldn't clothe or house himself. God subjected himself to that. The weakness, frailties, and dependencies that we experience, God added 
a human nature to his own nature and then still remained God. That's a mystery that's hard for us to really understand. He completed a compatibility between the unfallen human nature and the divine nature that the two could be joined together. And this shows that we are truly made in the image of God. Verse 24 then, when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born and Joseph named him Jesus. Joseph's obedience here is notable. He did not doubt, he didn't waver, he didn't have second thoughts that Matthew makes us aware of or describes. Instead, Joseph understood the truth and the importance of the angelic messenger that came to him in the dream, and he took confidence in that and he acted on it. Now something else here, I don't know if you, have, if you cringe, maybe you're not as prudish as me, but verse 25, but he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born and Joseph named him Jesus. That always kind of troubled me a little bit. Why would Matthew underscore this point? Why include this statement about something so highly personal in a marriage? Well, the emphasis by Matthew is on the fact that Jesus was conceived miraculously. Matthew doesn't want us to lose sight of that fact. He doesn't want there to be any ambiguity, ambiguity, excuse me. <laughs> he doesn't want there to be any ambiguity around that statement. So he adds that Joseph had no sexual union with Mary until she had given birth to Jesus. Okay, now our story moves away, that brief little description of the birth, now it moves away to the visitors from the east, the wise men, uh, stories that don't uh, come to us in the other Gospels. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the reign of King Herod. Let's stop and look at King Herod for a minute. Herod the Great, there was a reason he was called the Great. He was wealthy, politically gifted, intensely loyal to Rome, an excellent administrator, and clever enough to remain in the good graces of successive Roman emperors. His famine relief was superb, and his building projects, including the temple that began 20 BC, were admired even by his enemies. But he loved power. Does that sound familiar with our day and age? He loved power and inflicted incredibly heavily, heavy taxes on the people, a huge burden. And he resented the fact that many Jews considered him a usurper, didn't really recognize him as uh, their king. In his last years, suffering an illness that compounded his paranoia, he turned to cruelty and fits of rage and jealousy. He even killed close associates. So what is demonstrated here? Well, there is one important fact from this little background on Herod, and it's this. God can use a Judas, and God can use a Herod for his purposes, which as we know, God indeed did. Well, about this time, and I'm back to the scripture now, uh, about this time, some wise men uh, from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. Now, these travelers are called wise men, which in the ancient Greek is magi, and misconceptions and legends exist about these men. You know, it, it is uh, just a weakness in humankind that in the absence of information, we fill in the gaps and we invent things. And the legends around the wise men include things like their name, the fact that they were kings when they weren't, a whole host of things. They were not kings, but wise men, which means for that day and age, they were astronomers, learned men. The tradition that the Magi were kings possibly can be traced to the influence of Old Testament passages that say this about the Messiah. Kings will come and worship the Messiah. So, of course, the wise men came, bowed down, and worshiped Jesus, and so it, immediately that passage came to people's minds, and that's where that understanding, perhaps, that they were kings came from. There were not only three but probably a great company of men, not just three wise men, but a great company of men, uh, because men of their stature or wealth would have found it too 
dangerous to travel alone. So they would come with all their attendants, helpers, a grand caravan. The idea that there were three wise men comes from the fact that it is recorded in Matthew that there were three gifts. Now, people like to say that uh, the gold speaks of royalty or incense speaks of divinity or myrrh anticipates and speaks of death since it was an embalming spice. But really, I think we can, we can put that aside. The, the Magi brought these gifts unaware. They simply wanted to honor the kings, king of the Jews. Um, that was the tradition, to bring gifts when you came into the house of, of a notable person. So they seem to have come not on the birth night, that's something else of importance, but probably several months later. Being from the east, that phrase, or being from eastern lands, tells us that they would have been among Jews who were exiled from Judah and Israel centuries before. So the promise of Messiah would be familiar to them. And they, like other believing Jews, were waiting for the political de deliverance of Israel through Messiah. So they, they come from eastern lands, they arrive in Jerusalem, they're asking where is the newborn king of the Jews, they talk about this mysterious star, and they tell Herod that they want to worship him. Now Spurgeon, you know how I like Spurgeon, he makes a really interesting observation here. He says this, it has been truly remarked that the shepherds did not miss their way, they came to Christ at once, while the wise men even with a star to guide them, missed their way and went to Jerusalem instead of Bethlehem and inquired at the palace of Herod instead of at the stable where the Christ was born. It not it uh, true that so oftentimes we seek out information in the wrong places, go to the wrong places to get that which we need to shed light or to give truth to something that we are looking or considering? Verse 3 then, King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. This is a key sentence here. Obviously, a big stir was uh, among the people and obviously in King Herod. But a stir, and this is another Spurgeon quote, so forgive me, a stir begins as soon as Christ is born. He has not spoken a word. He has not made a miracle. He has not proclaimed a single doctrine. But when Jesus was born at the very first, while as yet you hear nothing but infant cries and can see nothing but infant weakness, still his influence upon the world is manifest. When Jesus was born, there came wise men from the east and so forth and so on. There is infinite power even in an infant savior, Spurgeon says. I just love that quote, that Jesus doesn't do anything. It's just that he's a baby, but by his very nature, by the fact that he's God, by who he is, the world is changed. And here is infinite power in an infant savior, right at the start. Verse four, uh, he called a meeting. This is Herod again. We're back in Herod's court. Herod calls a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem and in Judah, they answered, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities. For a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. So here's Herod asking information about the Messiah. The religious authorities are giving him this information, telling him of this uh, prophet's um, statement about where the Messiah will come from Bethlehem, out of Judah. And yet, sadly, these experts have all the right information that they can give Herod, but they seem personally uninterested in meeting the Messiah for themselves. We don't see in the Matthew uh, book or in Luke that these people answer Herod and then rush out to try to find the Messiah for themselves. It may be said that they dreaded the coming of the Messiah because then they themselves may lose power just as Herod. All right, verse 7. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. 
Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star that they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Well, whatever the star was, it is significant in our story, and it was significant for them. It was significant that God met these men, met these astronomers in their own medium. He guided them by a star. Now, this also was a fulfillment of the prophecy in Numbers 24, 17, which said, A star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter, meaning a kingly scepter, shall rise out of Israel. This was a widely regarded uh, ancient messianic prediction that most Jewish scholars would know and agree with. And so uh, we see God using the star and the prophecy fulfilled. Um, so they entered the house, to, the, the wise men entered the house to Mary. Now notice that Jesus here is called a young child. And he's likely between the ages of 6 and 18 months. So we also notice that against custom, the child is mentioned before the mother, underscoring the focus is on the baby king. So all those nativities that we have, I love them all. We have several of them. But it's probably an error uh, to include the wise men, along with the shepherds, uh, at the manger at Jesus' birth because we know uh, that it came later when we do the dating based on King Herod and, and when this uh, visit by the Eastern wise men uh, took place. Now something else to notice, the phrase here, with his mother, Jesus with his mother Mary and the wise men bow down and worship him. Uh, anybody observing this, and, and there would have been lots of people because soon as royalty comes in the neighborhood, people notice, and it attracts followers. So there was probably some observation of this um, group of people, notoriety, uh, coming to the house of Mary and Joseph. And it must have been a curious sight to see these impressive dignitaries bowing low before a young child. At that time, the Jewish people, it, we need to just realize were often despised and dishonored because of their unique customs and belief and also they were despised often due to jealousy because of their success and prosperity and we know that to be true of human beings we both um, admire at times and are jealous at times of those that uh, have success and prosperity and so it was at that time with Jews as a group of people but even further, deeper than that, they were often described by their conquerors as a low, troublesome, and conquered race. And so that made it all the more remarkable that these kings were coming to the home of a Jewish baby and bowing low to this baby. It was remarkable that the wise men would trouble themselves so much to honor this infant king, but even more so, a king of the Jews. Now, it's unusual for a baby to be born a king. We know that if you trace the kings and queens of Europe, usually what happens, they are a prince in waiting for a long period of time before their parent passes away and they become king or crowned king. But the kingly status of Jesus wasn't conferred on him later, it was conferred on him at birth. We know Jesus was king from the very time that he was born. Again, speaking to God, King of the universe, and his son, Jesus Christ. So these wise men come to the house. They, they, they we're told that it's in a house. So we know right there by that statement that it is not at the manger. Uh, and, and this also is consistent with our understanding of them coming later to see the, um, the baby Jesus. So they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And again, it was common, especially in the Far East, that one would never appear before royalty or a person of importance without bringing gifts. And considering who these wise men uh, believed the young child to be, that is the Messiah, 
it's not surprising that they came with these lavish gifts. Now, something else that we can draw from this passage, the precious gifts were not presented to Mary or Joseph. They were laid down at the feet or around the manger, or, or since the, it wasn't the manger, I correct myself here, since it was at the house of Jesus, whatever he was sleeping in, they were laid down by him. So we can surmise from this that the infant Jesus did not use or spend any of these precious gifts. He didn't have the ability to. But we can think that his parents used them in the following months, more than likely, to defray the cost of the journey into Egypt and back again for their living expenses. These gifts were gifts that were easily uh, bartered or exchanged for goods and other things that were needed. And we can go on to maybe infer from this that God knew what those needs would be uh, for them to escape to Egypt and come back again. And he met them in this rather unique way as gifts that came from wise men to baby Jesus for the use of the family. All right, verse 12. When it was time to leave, they returned, the wise men again, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Again, another dream. These dreams had to be powerful because they changed the course of history, changed the course of those that had these dreams. So like Joseph, the wise men are obedient to the heavenly dream and leave without serving as Herod's informants. They don't go back and give Herod the information that he wants. Well, after the wise men, verse 13, after the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord uh, excuse me, I left out verse 12. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. And so after uh, the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, another dream. Get up, Joseph, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Now that's a nightmare, isn't it? You have this beautiful baby, he's a baby king, and you get this warning from God that Herod, the all-powerful Herod, is, is going to kill him. So Herod was to be feared, as he was constantly on guard against threats to his rule uh, from his own family or anyone else he suspected of being a threat. He, he, especially in his later years, as I said before, he, he would assassinate anyone and everyone that was a threat, including family members. Well, verse 14, that night Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. Now, we make note here that Joseph's rapid, leaving the very night of the dream is what it says, uh, and complete obedience is impressed impressive. It is unlikely that Joseph ever imagined such events when he first uh, betrothed Mary in Nazareth. So picking up the scripture again, uh, verse 15, this fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet. I called my son out of Egypt. Now Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem, who were two years old and under, based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. So just a little information here. Bethlehem was a small place, not a large place. We know that. And then we limit the pool of people that Herod was going to kill to only those that were two years old or younger. So there's no um, exact descriptions of this event in secular history. And some might say, well, then doesn't that put into doubt this story that's contained in Matthew? Well, not really, because again, uh, it, it is probably um, easy to understand that since Bethlehem was small, the number of babies and people in Bethlehem, those under two years of age, was such, so small. And given in a time when all of Herod's actions were ruthless, well-known, and vicious, this event would seem like small potatoes, probably go unnoticed, not make it into the historical record, so to speak. So it's just in harmony with Herod's character in his last year. And the, the death of the children might be as many as a, a dozen or so. 
And so it, it, we don't see it in the secular historical record because it probably would have just simply gone unnoticed or been insignificant compared to all the other atrocities that would have been recorded by secular her historians in such violent times. Okay, verse 17. Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A cry was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are dead. So what, what does this mean? Why is that included in Matthew? Well, it's a quotation from Jeremiah 31, 15. And it originally referred to the mourning of Israel's mothers during the conquest and captivity of the nation. And here in this passage, Rachel then is a representation of Bethlehem's mothers weeping for the loss of their baby sons. So Matthew uh, takes some, uh, uses as a literary tool to, to, to help the reader, uh, the, the Jewish reader, understand the mourning and the grief of mothers in Bethlehem, likening it to this uh, quotation about Rachel weeping for her children, which were the children of Israel at the time of, of captivity. Well, that's our passage for this week. But our prayer for this week, I, I want to change your focus just a little bit, reflecting on what we read and what we saw in our Christmas story today. So I've given you a quote here, and I want you to let the meaning of this quote just kind of roll around in your mind, kind of cogitate, meditate on it, think about it. Let me read the quote to you, and then you'll see why I'm asking you to do this. In what sense, then, is Christ's, is Christ's title, God with us? Jesus is called Emmanuel, or God with us, in his incarnation. God with us by the influence of his Holy Spirit in the Holy Sacrament, in the preaching of the word, in private prayer, and God with us through every action of our life that we begin, continue, and end in his name. He is God with us to comfort, enlighten, protect, and defend us in every time of temptation and trial, in the hour of death, in the day of judgment. And he is God with us and God in us, and we with and in him to all eternity. That's by a theologian and scholar named Clark. And um, you'll need to read it a couple times to fully grasp it. But I think it is a rich statement that will help you as you look at this Christmas story in the coming week. So until Sunday, thanks for joining me.